Alrighty, so today we're going to cover the lecture on creating a network between virtual machines in VirtualBox. Specifically, what we're going to try and do today is we're going to try and set up a connection between our host environment and our Debian virtual machine. We're also going to do this with both dynamic and static addresses. I'll first show you how to do it with a dynamic address, making it relatively easy. And then we're going to make it a static address, as if we're going to set up some kind of a server-like setup. Okay. Um, both are acceptable. Both require different kinds of configuration once we get into the nitty-gritty of the configuration file. But before we do anything else, we're going to make changes to our system. So, as a general rule, I encourage people to clone. If you've already cloned your virtual machine, and of course we're going to do a full clone, as always, because we want to make a backup of our hard drive when we do our full clone. If you've done and completed the activity for adding a new hard drive and on that hard drive two partitions to your instance of Debian, everything's working fine, you can delete that clone, okay? If you still have that clone, you can still clone it again, all right? It says Debian Linux clone, you might want to give it version 2 or something like that so it doesn't overwrite the other clone, all right? You don't need multiple instances of a clone. But even if you still have an old clone from the hard drive activity, you can still create another clone as well. The choice is yours. I don't need it. i am completed the hard drive activity. I really only need a clone now of the existing system where I've got the second hard drive and the two partitions on it. So I've cl cloned my Linux. I have a backup. Now I can start doing the network settings. Now, before we do anything else, as you can see in the lecture notes of today's uh, class, there is a Word document in Learn talking about creating a network between virtual machines and virtual box. Okay? You're going to want to have this open and off to the side for today's lecture. One of the first things we need to do is to verify that our environment is set up in virtual box before we go any further. Not strictly speaking required, you may want to pause this at various points to make sure your settings are correct, but we are going to do a sanity check. And again, in the context of information security, you always want to do a sanity check. So let's first check our environment. If we go to VirtualBox Manager, go under File, you will see there is a Host Network Manager. You can also hit Control H on the keyboard, but we want to open up the Host Network Manager. What happens in VirtualBox is that the host environment can have its own virtual network, its own virtual LAN, if you will, a VLAN in the um, VM parlance. Um, but long story short, when you set up network connections, you have a couple of different choices available in VirtualBox. The three biggies are, there's four of them that I'm aware of. The three biggies are a bridged network. Um, there's another one where you can set up um, a host-only network. And the third one, if you actually want, ever want to see what those options are, you can just go into your settings and it'll show you. There's the NAT, that's the one I couldn't remember. There's the bridged, and then there's the host-only network. You can also create an internal network. You can play with some other things as well. But NAT, Bridged, and the host only are the big three that I typically see. Okay? When we set up our Debian, we set up two adapters. One on NAT and one on the host only network. We're going to verify that host network before we move on. We're going to go under File and manage that host network with the host network manager. Again, Control H or File Host Net Manager. And it'll bring up this dialog box like this. Normally, you will see VirtualBox host only Ethernet adapter. It will normally say 192.168.56.1. If you want to match the lecture notes, you want to maybe change it for that. DHCP is enabled. Adapter. The same address, 192.168.56.1, 255.255.0, DHCP server, enable. You want the address of the DHCP server at 100, 
okay? It needs to claim an address for itself. I recommend 100. What this does, and you'll see more of this in your um, networking classes with Jeff, but basically when you're setting up a network, it's often good to delineate it between static addresses, when you hard code assign an address to, and dynamic addresses, addresses that are assigned on the fly as machines need them. When we talk about addresses, what we're really talking about is kind of like a phone number for your telephone or your cell phone. All right? You need to have a number to be able to reach that phone. That phone needs a number to be able to talk on the cellular network. It's the same with an IP address. It needs an IP address so you can talk to it and so it can talk on the network. You can hard code it or you can allow it to grab it dynamically. We're initially going to set it up to grab it dynamically and then we're going to set it to static. That means we need a pool of static IP addresses and a pool of dynamic addresses to use. To that end, this is the configuration I recommend. And again, it is the default. Some of you may need to tweak it to match this, but this is the default in VirtualBox. Server address should probably be 100. The server mask should be 255.255.255.0. The lower bound address, which is the first address available in the pool, is 192.168.56.101. The upper bound address, which is the highest address it can assign dynamically, is 192.168.56.254. So you should ensure that your addresses are similar to these. If you want your network configuration to match the network notes that I have in this lecture, in this series of lectures, it doesn't hurt to make sure that they match exactly. Okay. The important thing is, is that whatever the network address is, which is the first three addresses in this case, 192.168.56, that's the network address. That matches, the adapter has 192.168.56. something. DHCP is 192.168.56, 192.168.56, 192.168.56. And for both server masks or net masks um, both of these should be 255 255 255 okay once you have it confirmed that you can click on apply if necessary if you have to change any of these settings there is value in restarting windows Sometimes students are able to change these settings without problems, but I have seen issues in VirtualBox where if you've had to change these things, if you've had to enable or create an adapter and set all these things up, they often benefit from rebooting their computer. If there is no VirtualBox, then you need to click on Create and make sure your settings match my settings. Once you've done that, click on Apply. If you don't change anything, you can close. And after you've verified your network, after you've cloned your VM, you can then start your original VirtualBox virtual machine. Now, for those of you who've been paying attention in the past, you will have seen me already have gone in and configured my network settings so that I can use a remote tool. We're going to talk about that today. That tool is called PuTTY. You've seen me configure this and use PuTTY in the past. I've disabled all that so that my environment matches your environment, which means that we're going to have to initially do this through this interface. Okay, actually, all of this lecture is going to be through this interface. Less than ideal, but I'll try and zoom in on it when I'm um, deploying this to YouTube. As I am going to be changing network settings, I am going to log in as root. Okay. The first thing, anytime you want to start working with the network, is you want to verify your network settings. And what we see here, I don't really know. I'm just going to move this off to the side so you can see what's going on. And I lost VirtualBox. I don't know how that happened, but okay. I have two adapters, NAT and host only. You can see them right here. And I can also see them here. ENP0S3 
has grabbed an address that lets me talk to the internet. The 10.0.2.15 network address means that this virtual machine can talk to the internet. It's just one of those things in VirtualBox that you learn over time. The second adapter, ENP0S8, shows that it is not configured, that it does not have an IP address. That is the one on my host-only network. So I'm going to have to modify this adapter to get it working on the host-only network. So let's do that together now. Okay. The first thing we need to do is to ensure that we're logged in as root, and we need to modify a config file. Just like we modify, modified the file system table, the fstab in the Etsy directory, to add partitions to our file system, we need to modify a server configuration file for network services. And because we're changing our system settings, we need to be logged in as root. So I am logged in as root, and I want to modify using nano, I want to modify forward slash etc forward slash network, n-e-t-w, and I'm going to use the tab key on my keyboard. Tab key is your friend. It auto-completes and mitigates the risk against typos. Forward slash int tab key and it auto completes interfaces perfect and when I open up my file there's actually content there I will quickly exit if I mistype the word interface as opposed to interfaces I open up a config file and it is empty and it reports it as a new file chances are I have a typo I can verify it up here in the top where it says ETC or Etsy network interface. It's not interface, it's interfaces. I have the wrong file open. Control X to exit and I will try again and again. This is why we use the tab key. The tab key mitigates against typos. Much better. Let us now go and add our device to our environment. I scroll down to the bottom of my file, and now I need to add the second adapter. We know ENP0S3 is working. If you recall earlier, ENP0S8 is not working. We have to make that work. Now, you don't have to add a comment. The little hash and the, in this case, the, let's call that aquafoam blue or aquamarine blue font is an indicator of a comment. Strictly speaking, you don't have to comment, but you're all IT students. You've all heard this before. We always comment our code. Same thing applies with config files. If you are a systems person and you're going in and modifying files, you should comment it that you were the person that made that change and why. Okay, so I am adding a host only adapter to Debian and I identify myself in this case I identify myself with my initials and I include the date this lecture will be viewed on I believe the 20th of September 2022 okay so I'm going to um, modify my config file and I'm going to identify why I'm modifying the file and who I am and the date that I modified it as well. It just helps me in the future and it helps the next person who comes across this config and says, what the hell is this? Well, you can tell them what this is. You can show them. Other than that, the two lines used for ENP0S3 can be used for ENP0S8. Typos will get you. So if you're having problems, go back, review your code, and make sure you have no typos. Typos will get you every time. So allow dash hot plug. A lot of people miss the dash. Space ENP 0 S8. S3 is working. We need to add S8. And by the way, this is on page four of today's handout. Um, right near the bottom. If you want to see the syntax, it's also on page four of the lecture notes for today's lecture. All right. So allow hot plug ENP0S8. I face ENP0 
S8 INET. And first thing, we're going to test it with DHCP. So basically, it's exactly the same as ENP0S3, except we've changed the interface 3 to interface 8. All right. And then other than that, that's it. That's all we're going to do for now. Control-O to save. Enter for the file name right here, right out. Control-O, it will prompt a file name. Enter is fine. You don't need to change the file. You want to overwrite the existing config file. And then we can do Control-X. And like that, we should have a functioning um, configuration. All right. At this point, you can do IF up. Interface up, IF up, ENP 0 S8. If you see something like this, it is talking to the DHCP server that we verified earlier, and then it will assign an IP address. In this case, the IP address is 56.140. Perfect. That's what we want to see. The ultimate test is, of course, to reboot, and also you don't have to type in IF up. You can just type in reboot, and it'll also try and grab an IP address when it comes up. I'm not done messing around with my settings, so I'm going to log in as root again. Perfect. And we can verify our IP settings by using this command here, IP space ADDR. It's at the bottom of page 5 of the handout. I actually reference it several times. We are now moving on to... I'm not going to do that. I'm going to move on to setting a static IP before I take a look at playing around with PuTTY. So I moved on to the top of page 9 of the handout. I'll come back to the top of page 6 and set up and run PuTTY. Um, but for now, I'm just going to uh, set a static IP. At this point, I've got a dynamic IP address. That's perfect. Everything's working great. But let's say I want to set a static IP. I need to modify that configuration file that I set up before. Okay, So let's take a look at that. Again, I'm going to use nano. And I'm going to modify that same file again. Etsy network w tab to autocomplete forward slash int tab to autocomplete. It opens up the file I modified before. Perfect. I don't need to really change my comment because I'm still playing with the host only adapter. It's still me, and it is still something that I hope to talk about on the uh, 20th of September. Okay? But on this one, I'm going to change DHCP to static. I'm not going to use a dynamic address. If you recall, when we set up our host-only network, I said we're going to save a pool of static addresses and a pool of dynamic addresses. We grabbed one of the dynamic addresses, and it worked fine. But I want to set up a static address for this machine. So I'm going to change the dynamic that we see there to static. So, let's take a look at that. The next thing we do is when we set up a static address, we have to give it that static address. And that's why I reserve. That's why I reserved 100 addresses. It doesn't end up being 100. It's closer to 98 or 99 of them. But I set aside the first 100 addresses for static IP assignment. Let's grab one of those. I usually start around 20. That seems like a nice, safe place to start. If you want your environment to match my lecture notes going forward, you should probably start with 20 as well. So I'm going to say the address that I want to use for my static IP address is 192.168.56.20. I'm just going to say, let's. I'm going to start using static addresses around 20. And I'm going to assign them as necessary. I also need to say how big the network is. Now, when we were looking at um, the configuration in VirtualBox, we saw something that said 255.255.255.0. When you take more network classes with um, Jeff Price, you will 
um, see this again but what that is saying is that is a network size that can have 256 machines on it we also call that a slash 24 network so I'm going to say forward slash 24 at the end of my static IP address again as you can see at the top of page 9 of the handout now that slash 24 is a network size it means that the first 24 bits are assigned the last 8 bits are not assigned I don't want to go into it much further than that Jeff Price will further explain this in your network classes going forward okay you also will probably need a gateway address again I don't want to um, talk about Jeff's lectures in the future but I want you to think of a gateway address kind of like a room number if you want to go into one of the lecture rooms you have to go to the door and then you can walk in to the classroom and grab a desk and engage with your instructors um, that classroom address is kind of like the gateway address before I can talk to any of the machines on my network I need to have the address of that network and that is typically given to the gateway of that network so when I do again four spaces one two three four and I say gateway I am saying that is the address used to find this network 192.168.56.1 typically I don't want to speak in absolutes but typically the gateway address is the network address dot one in this case 192.168.56 is the network and the gateway for that network is dot one so that should be it I should be good at this point to then set a static IP address. Control O to write out, enter for the file name, Control X to exit, and I can take my address down and up. I can do IF down, ENP 0S8, it will take the address off. I can do IF up, ENP 0S8 to bring it back up online. Hmm didn't like that so I'm just going to reboot it and hopefully I don't have any typos in my config file if I do we'll take a look at it together to address normally you will see a little warning if there is a network problem as it boots I didn't see anything so I should be okay perfect my IP address went from 192.168.56.140 to 192.168.56.20. Perfect, that's exactly what I want to see. So, recap, I had two adapters, but only one of them was grabbing an IP address. The reason was, my network configuration file forward slash Etsy forward slash network forward slash interfaces was only configured for one adapter when I went into that file and added the configuration for the second adapter it was able to figure out what I wanted it to do and was able to grab an IP address either dynamically or after the modification statically now that it has a static IP I'm happy with I can configure remote connection to it and that's really the test it's fine to configure the network adapter it's fine for the network adapter to grab an IP address but the real test is are you able to connect to that IP address let's take a look now before I do anything else control X to exit and I'm going to exit out I don't need to be root anymore so I'm not going to be logged in as root we only need to be logged into root as necessary now in the lecture notes I talk about installing PuTTY I'm not going to go through that again the lecture notes are very clear where you can download it how you can download it and then once it's downloaded um, how to launch it now as you can see not only do I use um, yeah, ignore that McAfee stuff I don't think that's relevant anymore I should probably clean that up not only do I use VirtualBox a lot but I use PuTTY a lot as well now I have a new machine Okay, the machine is 192.168.56.20. Okay, I want to log in as SJ, so I'm going to go SJAY at 192. Now I can't log in as root, 
Some of the videos I've been assigning to you to review show, uh, I can't remember what the service is, but they show root connection. As a security person, you should resist remote root connections at every cost. We've talked about this in the past. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But if you know um, a username and a password, you can log into a system. That's the whole point of doing um, password cracking is trying to figure out a username so you can try and crack the passwords. If you know every Linux system out there has root configured by default, you know there's a root account. If you know there's a root account, all you need to do is figure out the password. Consequently, we never allow remote connections with root. You will see some corporate solutions out there that allow it. From a security point of view, I think that's a very bad idea, and I encourage you to never modify the configurations of any of your service to allow root connection over the network. The fact that Windows allows administrative connection over remote desktop or RDP is unacceptable in my opinion. Regardless, oh, because of that, I'm only going to try and log in as SJ. SJ at the IP address that I just configured. Now I can just do that every time or I can actually save the session and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to save this as um, bit Debian and Python. That's going to be my bit Debian and Python server for this for this course. I'm going to save that and while it is loaded because that's what's loaded right now bit Debian and Python Python I'm going to try and open that up. Now, because I've already tested this before recording this video, it didn't prompt me to say, hey, do you want to download this fingerprint? Basically, what you're doing is you're downloading a key for SSH, the encrypted protocol we're using for connecting with PuTTY over our network. If you get an alert saying, hey, do you want to save this? Say yes, you want to save that so in the future you don't have to save it again. It's a good idea to save it. We'll talk about security and keys in a future class. Okay, now it wants my password. And once I've typed that in, I have connected remotely to my virtual machine. The beauty of this is that I can make it as big or as small as I want. I can scale the size. And what's most impressive is that I can go into something like this. Uh, let's let's pick a command here. I'm going to find a real simple. Like I could just as easily type in IP adder. But let's say I have a command like IP adder. I can right click, copy that. I can go over here and with my right mouse button or my alternative mouse button. If you're using your mouse in your left hand, it's going to be the left mouse button. I can paste the command. I can copy and paste using PuTTY. If for no other reason, you should be using PuTTY for that kind of flexibility. The ability to copy and paste, the ability to copy and highlight, as you've seen me do in class, just makes PuTTY that much um, better an option. In the lecture notes, it also talks about creating a share. You can play with that. There's no requirement for that. It also talks about where and how to download PuTTY, um, what site to find it on. Um, I always recommend downloading it from greenend.org.uk. Just search for PuTTY, select the link from greenend.org.uk, download the full installer, the full installer for PuTTY, and then just install PuTTY. It gives you extra tools that we will be using in the future. Again, I will cover that in my lecture notes. Okay. Actually, no, I don't. There are add-ons. We're not going to talk about that, but yeah. If you have any questions or any problems with this, let your instructor know, and uh, I will take a look at it at that time. But at this point, you should have your networks set up properly, and you should have your file system table set up properly, and you should have PuTTY able to connect where's putty oh, i'm running putty you'd have putty able to connect directly um, using a static ip on your debian box once you have all of those pieces in place let your instructor know 
and we can sign off on the competency. Of course, be prepared to answer rather difficult and pointed questions because I will be asking them. Good luck.